everyone. Uh, it's Justin back with another interview. Today I have uh, Dominic Evans, who is a, you're a lot of things. You're a filmmaker. You're, um, uh, you're doing, you did a study, which we're going to mainly focus on for this interview. You're also an activist. T tell us like a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, thank you, Justin, for having me on your podcast. My name is Dominic Evans, and I am disabled and LGBTQ. Um, I'm trans and queer and non-binary. Uh, and I am a filmmaker, a film scholar, a consultant, and a writer, and a streamer. Those are the jobs I consider. Yeah. I don't know if yeah. I really feel like I consider myself an activist. I mean, I guess I am an activist, but but I don't feel comfortable in a lot of activist spaces. And mm -hmm. I've removed myself from those formal activists yeah. just because there's so much discrimination when it yeah, comes to intersectionality. Yeah. Yeah, but you're an activist in the sense that you like advocate for like disability policies and stuff like that. It's you true. Really it's true. I think I think when you're marginalized, your existence is inherently That's political. A, and I'm an activist, but it's like I have to be an activist. Right. You know right. what I mean? And I know that activism really spills through my work. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a film degree. I got a degree in production, so that means making films specifically, but I was really lucky that I had a really good teacher that was a film theorist, and she really stoked those fires behind what has led to my study, because when I was in my freshman year, I saw that we were talking about race, and we were talking about gender, we were talking about gender identity and sexuality, but there was nothing about disability yeah. and i said i've never seen myself represented as a trans wheelchair user yeah and the my tenure at my film school was all about not only my education but educating my professors about how disability is not included so I ended up taking an independent study and I watched a bunch of films and I basically did what we did in our study, yeah. broke it down by what is represented. And I was so, I want to say I was surprised. In some ways I was by how bad it was, but I knew it. I mean, I haven't been represented, so of course it's not good. Mm -hmm. And it really was like, nobody's talking about this in this educational circle I'm in. You know, I knew there were other activists kind of scattered around that were probably talking about it, uh, but I didn't know them. I didn't know what was being said or going on and, you know, come to find out disabled people have been protesting harmful representation of disability on television for, you know, decades, like starting with, uh, media event that really affected me personally, the Jerry Lewis telethon, which is the primary way a lot of people experience disability. They saw Jerry Lewis come on, say horrible stuff about wheelchair users, how we had no life, we were gonna die, and aren't you grateful you're kids and you are not like yeah. these people? He is unapologetic to people who complain. He's patronizing. But tell people about a child in trouble. If it's pity, we'll get some money. I'm just giving you facts. Pity? You don't want to be pity because you're a cripple in a wheelchair? Stay in your house. So those were the messages that I grew up with people experiencing about disability. So uh, it really inspired me to want to get in this work. Um, the same thing that... Um, was happening to actors in Hollywood happened to me in film school. I wasn't welcome. My professors and the people I was learning from welcomed me. But film is very collaborative. You're supposed to work with your peers. Yeah. Uh, all my peers were working together, helping each other. Uh, and I couldn't get any of them to be a part of anything I did. And I was walking to class one day with a girl in my class and she said, 
you know why people don't want you working with them? Because you can't help any of us. And that was it. She's like, you can't help us on our film set. And I said, well, I'm doing all this on my own film. You know, you yeah. could, you need people to help with sound. You mm -hmm. need help with people to help with uh, script supervising. I don't need to physically lift the yeah. camera. I can help you with organizational stuff. And it, I just wasn't welcome. You know, and it became physically harmful to me. There was a student in my class. He would sit behind me, swing his legs and kick my wheelchair the whole class. Oh, wow. uh, sophomore year, I moved my wheelchair forward. He would move the desk forward and follow me around the classroom. Uh, we had a, uh, our teacher was out on um, sabbatical. So we had a substitute who stopped returning my emails about this student who was harassing me. And it's it was just that kind of hostile environment. But because of all these experiences, this is why I wanted to study disability in film and talk about it and change it. Because not only does film affect us as disabled people, when we don't see ourselves, but it affects how people treat us. And my experience in film school was a direct result of people not seeing wheelchair users in television, in film. We learn from media how to treat people we don't know, because that's our only experience with these communities. And if all you see is that we're worthless, we can't do anything, we're gonna die, there's nothing good about us, we have no redeemable qualities, that's how you're gonna treat us. So going through all these uh, struggles, I guess, was what got me to where I am in the work I do. And I feel like it's very cyclical because uh, the work inspires the treatment of disabled people and the treatment of disabled people inspires the work. So I think that we'll see changes with both as we're seeing more inclusion. Yeah, yeah that's really interesting. Yeah, it's, it's always good to, to talk about the, like you mentioned, like the harassment you faced in film school. Like, I think it's it's like really good to talk about that because um, cause like I would, I. I like I wouldn't have I wouldn't have known um, like I wouldn't have known that 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 was a that was like a big thing at all um, and I bet like most of my viewers like if they're not um, if they're not around people in a wheelchair or they're they're not in a wheelchair themselves like they probably wouldn't know that like it's common for um, people like you to be um, harassed at like um, in, in those types of situations so I'm I'm really glad you you talked about that. Um, so I think we don't think that disabled people are mistreated. There is this yeah. weird belief that disabled people are almost special and we yeah. should be nicer to disabled people, but that's not reality, you know? And that's also condescending to like, you're, you're so special, we're gonna treat you differently. Exactly. Um, at the end of the day, disabled people wanna be treated like everybody else. And yeah. I, I tell people sometimes, picture yourself, but instead of walking, you just hit a button and wheel around. Yeah. Would you be different? Would you be, would you be a different Justin? I mean, you would in some ways, but uh, so what do you like to do? Do you like music? Do you like dancing? What do you like? You would still be that same Justin. Yeah. You still have those same interests. Yeah. You still feel the same way. If you had a crush on someone, you'd still have that crush. But when somebody uh, becomes disabled or you learn that someone is disabled, or you meet someone disabled, you suddenly, not you in particular, but just you yeah. at a societal level, think that there's something almost like, like I said, like special, like, mm -hmm. you know, and we even use that word to describe disabled people. Well, you're special, but special means different. And by different, yeah. we don't mean different in a good way. Right. I think a lot of people unintentionally think disabled people are less. And I don't think that's intuitive. I don't think people are like, God, look at that person in a wheelchair, they're less. 
I think it's just so ingrained in society that we're less that we're looked at as different than not disabled. And and, and because of like harmful representation in in media too. Yeah, that really feeds it too. Absolutely. Um. Yeah. So this is this is good stuff. I wanna I wanna go into like the the study. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, just starting with the, with the first, you, you explained, you explained, so you explained, uh, can you just explain a little bit what the study is? Sure. Since it's a, since it's a television, it's a television study, like how did you decide right. like which TV shows you were going to watch for it? Yeah. So we, uh, my girlfriend and I, Ashton, we are work partners. Ashton's a screenwriter and Ashton helped me through film school when my my classmates would not, she was my physical hands, legs, she did whatever I physically couldn't do. We were a team um, and she really showed my classmates, you know, there are ways disabled people can be accommodated and, you know, having someone help with the physical is a great way for that. So um, she kind of got a film school education without having to pay for it by going along the class and helping with my projects and things like that. So uh, she and I decided we wanted to start doing studies into disability representation because all of the studies we found were incomplete in that. They would talk about disabled characters, but some of them never watched any of the shows. They would just look up on IMDb if right. the characters were disabled. Nobody was writing about what the representation was like. Was it good? Was it bad? They were just saying, okay, X number characters were on for this season. And when it comes to representation, you could say, well, we have all this representation, but it's all crappy. So mm -hmm. how's that gonna help? So I also wanted to do that, but I also, all my work is done from an intersectional lens. Uh, as someone multiply marginalized, I don't wanna leave out other communities. So I wanted to know how many of these characters are white. I knew it was overwhelmingly white. Yeah. I knew it would be probably more male. Mm -hmm. I knew it would be um, probably a lot of less visible disabilities. They love to tack on things like, yeah. the one thing we found in the study was a, a, a relevance of people just saying things like, oh, I have allergies. Oh, mm -hmm. I have ADD. Oh, mm -hmm. I have uh, bipolar, but never actually seeing that play out. Right. But then that character becomes a disabled character by mentioning it. So mm -hmm. that, that was one of the phenomena we discovered. So we ended up doing a study. Our first study was in the TV. We're both big TV hounds. Our goal is to eventually run our own TV show or, or a bunch of TV shows. So that's where we got started. We eventually want to do film. I would love to have more people that we can hire. We're trying to raise money to do further studies where we can hire more people uh, that can, because there's just so much, even just the TV study. I don't think we're going to get all the TV shows because yeah. we're, we're, we're doing this yearly and we're working on our second study right now and there's over 500 shows so how do we choose the shows we actually make a list of all of the shows that air between a certain period of time um and there are certain requirements because uh there's there's thousands of shows worldwide yeah. each year one they have to be english language just because it's it's hard for us to follow the subtitles when we're watching things so quickly. So some of the shows do have like moments where they are like, uh, what's a good example? Um, oh, what's that show? It's the, uh, I'm totally blanking on the name. It's basically the spinoff of Sons of Anarchy. It's set in like uh, Southern California slash Mexico. They speak a lot of Spanish. So something like that, where they go between English and Spanish, we would include. Yeah. But um, generally, if it's completely in a different language, we don't include it. Um, a lot of the shows have been mostly US based, but we do also watch some Canadian, Australian and British, depending on where they air. So 
We look at certain networks that air here in the U.S. We write out all the shows. We split them up amongst ourselves and whatever we get to. That's really what happened the first year. We ended up watching 180 shows for the first study, just Ashton and I, and another friend who watched one or two of the, the shows. And then Ashton compiles all the data. So uh, as we're watching, I have a little form that says, you list like name, disability, mm -hmm. what's the gender of the person. So it would be like cis female or cis male or non-binary their sexual orientation, if we know. That's another phenomenon. Disabled people don't always get to have a, a sense of sexual orientation or sexuality or sexual presence. So uh, there are a lot of unknown sexualities yeah. listed, but you would be not be surprised to know that when sexuality is a thing, it's almost always heterosexual. Yeah. No. So, um, it's like you can't be more than one thing in Hollywood. You're either gay or disabled or not white. <laughs> Being yeah, any yeah. of those other things is is considered. Now that's considered special if they if we want to go back to using the word special. But seriously though, so we decided to do this study from March. 2018 to 2019 mm -hmm. we released it last year uh and then or no we released it at the end of this year or not the end of this year beginning of this year i'm sorry about that we actually released it right as corona was starting to come out and mm -hmm. that uh made it hard for us to get some traction with people viewing it so people are still sort of discovering it because this year's been so weird. We'll probably release our second paper and whatnot next March. So right now we're working on March 2019 to 2020 shows. And then as soon as that paper and report are released, we'll be watching for 2020 to 21. So what's airing right now will be the next year's study we're working on so yeah like you said like a lot like some of the things were kind of unsurprising like you know they're mostly white male cis head all that um another thing that was kind of like like i could have probably predicted that was like alcoholism is like a very common disability one thing that surprised me a lot was that um like you know of the of like from what we know um 70 percent of those uh people who are disabled are played by oh no so i guess it's as guys it's out of the total 70 70 percent are who are disabled are played by non-disabled actors or it's unknown if they're if they're they have yeah um, yeah it's it's uh, significant that mm -hmm. that we're not allowed to play ourselves yeah so yeah so it's, it's kind of been like a hot topic recently because especially with race because of all the stuff with race going on where like the race of the character they're playing is different from their own race and they're stepping down because of that right um, do you think that the the reason why that number is so high 70 percent, is because studios don't audition enough enough uh disabled people for disabled parts or do you think it's more because there aren't enough actors with those disabilities um and so they kind of don't have much choice or or is it some, because of something else what do you it's, think? it's a variety of things yeah. so the first thing is they are definitely not auditioning enough disabled people so when there's a disabled role a lot of times if it's a lead role they have they'll already have an actor in mind for that mm -hmm. role and they'll be a named actor and they use the excuse well we don't have any named disabled actors that we know of but the thing is if you don't give disabled actors opportunities of course you're not going to have yeah. any known disabled actors it's a it's a really weak excuse look at somebody like steven spielberg who made his career on casting unknown people and Hollywood can say, oh, we have to have a name. But there are so many films. A, a great example is that Kevin Hart, Brian Cranston movie where Brian Cranston played a disabled person and Kevin Hart with his, was his caregiver. Uh, Kevin Hart's a big name. So mm -hmm. is Brian Cranston. You could have still had the caregiver be a big name and yeah. cast a disabled person. There's no excuse when you already have a big name 
uh, there, and, well, and there's really no excuse in general. Shouldn't it go to the best actor, regardless exactly. of who they are? You know, and uh, I do think that we need to be training more disabled actors. I do think that there are less disabled actors than uh, some other communities because. Uh, I'm a great example. I grew up as an actor and then I'm not, I'm not. Why am I not? Because there was, I realized that there were not opportunities for me, that I was better served making films, creating those opportunities. But my heart was in theater and acting, but to just not even think you have that opportunity because of the exclusion, you know? There, I hear all the time, people message me all the time saying, I wanted to be an actor, but I, nobody would ever cast me. Nobody would ever give me an opportunity to audition. Uh, and I just realized there was no chance for me. That's a reality for disabled actors. And one of my goals has been to work with schools to get them encouraging disabled students yeah. to come to their acting programs. It, when you move to Hollywood or New York, you inevitably start taking classes, acting classes, movement classes, uh, accents, you know, you want to perfect your craft. A lot of those classes are in inaccessible buildings. They are in, they are in uh, places that disabled people are not welcome um, or, or can't get to. Uh, some of the prices might be really high. And if you're a disabled person living on a fixed budget because you need health care, you know, mm -hmm. you 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 can't really do a lot of a lot of work to where you're making so much money, you're living on a fixed income. Yeah. All of these are barriers to acting, you know. So I do think that is something that needs to be addressed, but I don't think it's where creators are saying when they say when they right. use that as an excuse of I can't find any disabled people uh there's an overwhelming amount of them that don't even audition disabled people I also think we need to quit with this disabled roles thing because disabled people do not usually get called in for any roles but those that are considered disabled uh, a disabled actor should get to audition for a role like if they need a daughter or a person on a bus or yeah. there, there are a million different roles on your film set that you could audition a disabled actor for, but they only want to call them in for the disabled role. And yeah. if they're not even giving the disabled roles uh, the audition opportunity to disabled people, so mm -hmm. they say, we got this great role, we're casting Hillary Swank, that means that disabled person doesn't even get the opportunity yeah. to, it's already been given to, to Hillary Swank or Brian Cranston or Daniel Day-Lewis or Eddie Redmayne or all of these actors that have played disabled characters. And so when people say, well, he was the best actor for the job, we don't know that because nobody else got the chance yeah, to yeah. try out or audition. So I think what will help get more disabled people in Hollywood is to do away with this idea of disabled roles, disabled stories. I do think we should tell some stories about disabled experiences, but those shouldn't be the only time we're included yeah. Our lives are not all about disability. I see a lot of reflection on the LGBT community and our evolution through film. So I think disability is sort of where LGBT representation was in the 90s, where all the stories were about us coming out or how our families were affected or finding love for the first time. It was always about us being gay or trans or it was never about this is a story and Susan just happens to be a lesbian it was always Susan's a lesbian she's coming out her yeah. family hates her and you know 
um, that's disability. It's always about I'm accepting or not accepting my disability. I'm living or dying from it. I'm, mm -hmm. uh, I hate myself because I'm disabled. My mom hates everything because I'm disabled. I affect how my brother lives because I'm disabled. You know, it's always disabled, disabled, disabled. Mm -hmm. I want to see the disabled love story where Bob just happens to be disabled and yeah. he meets Susan and they fall in love. Mm -hmm. But really, Bob is trans and 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 black and and Susan is, uh, you know, cis but but bisexual and Asian. Yeah, you know, yeah. I want to see that story. You know, yeah. I don't want to see another. I'm. Susan, my kid's disabled, it's ruined my life, and now they're dead. Yeah. That, you know, that's a common thing. We see the tropes. You're either dead, better dead than disabled, that's a good trope, or you're a super crip where you're so magical and so inspiring and oh look it's little autistic jim and he's going to make everybody feel so much better about their lives no autistic jim is a doctor and is doing well in his phd uh classes and he's about to discover something new and amazing i'm going to see that story yeah. about an autistic person and jim is actually thought short for jamina so it's not really about a guy named jim it's a it's a non-white autistic woman because uh, that's another thing we go by stereotypes in the community too yeah. autistic people are always white men where is the autistic woman that is not white who struggled all her life to see herself represented. Where does she get her representation, you know? And uh, I'm also big into, if I'm not seeing myself, there's another person who's not seeing themselves. Yeah, so yeah. let me bring everybody along with me. I don't understand the pettiness in communities where I'm just gonna do what's good for me and I'm gonna leave all y'all behind, you know? I'm not like that. I grew up poor and I was left behind all the time. I want to bring everybody with me while I can. If I can use whatever power and privilege I have in this life, and it's not always that much, but if I can use it to help myself and others, then I'm doing what I, I'm comfortable with in this world. You know, I, I don't want anybody to ever feel like I did growing up, like I was alone and nobody loved me or cared about me yeah. and I didn't deserve anything. So if I can stop little kids that are marginalized from feeling that, then I've succeeded. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I wish there would be more stories where someone's disabled, but like it doesn't have to do with the plot. It's just like they happen to be disabled and they're just doing their thing. Like they're just doing a like a movie that that doesn't revolve around the fact that they're disabled. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, another thing I was curious about was so we, we talked a little bit about like like uh, harmful representation. Uh, there are a lot of shows that have villains who are disabled, like The Flash, for example, where you have like the thinker main villain of Devoe, the main villain of season four, who's who's in a wheelchair. There's there's examples like that across different TV shows and movies. Well, it worked. The Flash is back in Central City. It appears things are going as planned. As if there were any doubt. What's our next step? I'm thinking. Do you think that's unhealthy because it's it's you know kind of stereotyping disabled people as like evil villains, or do you think yeah. it's actually better because it's it increases the overall amount of representation? No, no, and that was a really important part of our study was showing that not all representation is created equal saying okay we have all these disabled characters we have a lot of disabled characters what was it 708 on 108 shows you know that that was a shock because we always hear there's not enough no there is a lot now where it's distributed is not great the majority are big characters we need to see more main and supporting characters that are disabled 
but also representation that is not good doesn't help disabled. Yeah. So I, I love that you brought up the Flash because that's my go-to example. The Flash is so infuriating to me because in so many areas, it's great, you know? They're just in terms of having some really interesting characters. Like I think uh, Iris, I love Iris. Although, you know, the, c talking about representation, I've heard people say she's not the best example of a black woman being represented. So even then where, you know, people are saying they don't always feel like the diverse representation in other areas is great in The Flash, but the potential for all this great representation on The Flash is there. But every season they make their villain disabled. This is a theme for The Flash, yeah. you know? There was the thinker, there was Savitar who, spoiler alert, if you've not seen it, you should probably not listen to what I'm about to say. Savitar was Barry Allen scarred. Yeah. So you made him disabled and he became evil. That, I mean, what does that say about disabled people or people with scars? That, that scars make you evil, you know? Yeah. That's a huge thing we do to villains is scar them. We also saw that in, what was that? The movie Wonder Woman, the movie Wonder Woman, the villain, they made her a scarred villain, you know? So we see it in all forms of media. When you're uh, evil, you become scarred. Or yeah, like the, uh, the, 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 Freddy Krueger, yeah. example think, of that. I think maybe the most, like, one of the most popular examples of that would be like the Joker, who's like kind of like the definition of evil and he has like big scars here. Um, and it's yeah, like, yeah, scars. absolutely. Yeah, scarring or bodily differences, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the misrepresentation of people with facial and bodily differences yeah. is horrific. Uh, next to that, I would say the only other represent, well, not the only other representation <laughs> that gets this bad, but what some of the other representation I feel is on this level of bad would be the representation of dissociative identity disorder, which is yeah. uh, which used to be called multiple personality disorder. Uh, that's always portrayed really horribly. And when the movie Split came out, I had so many people with uh, DID messaging me in tears saying, my family saw the trailer for Switch and now, or Split, and now they think I'm a monster. I'm wondering, have you, uh, have you seen Doom Patrol? Because there, there's actually one of the lead characters with DID. No, I have not. I have not seen that. Yeah, I can't speak to whether it's fully accurate or not because I don't. I'm not familiar enough with the disease. Uh, I know that definitely that like she's she's like a good character. Like she's not she's not a villain. She's like one of the main protagonists. Um, so it is interesting that you have that. Um, but I'm not, I, I'm not familiar with the split movie. But it is interesting that you have at least one um, somewhat positive example of it. Meet Jay. Some people call her crazy Jane. Jane is a person who experienced trauma early on in her life. 64 personas, each with its own special power. I think Jane's pretty complex. She's the one who's on the surface most of the time. She has to deal with all of these personalities clawing their way up. You are? A baby doll, duh, I'm your biggest fan. Baby doll, she's a little girl. Flit is a personality who can teleport anywhere. Hello, Hammerhead. Good to see you. Die, we die. Hammerhead is Jane's tough personality, and she comes in when Jane is sort of antagonized. She's just ready to kick some ass. Jane? Jane is in here right now. Because Jane can't handle having all of those feelings all at once, these personalities will rise to the occasion. Yeah. I would, I definitely will have to check that out. Um, do you have any like big takeaways from the results of your study? Well, the biggest takeaway is that we need to have more stories that involve what I've said before, disabled people just living life, mm -hmm. you know, or, or getting fantastical adventures, you know, and, and by fantastical, when we think disabled and fantastical, we think the Boy Who Could Fly. I don't know if you know that film. It's from when I grew up in the 80s. It's about 
uh, this boy. He's he does not speak verbally. Uh, I always assumed they made him autistic and his neighbor is like entranced with him and she learns that he can basically fly and he flies around and mm -hmm. it's all about how he's so special but everybody's so mean because he's uh, I guess they never say he's autistic but he's clearly disabled and he was the first example I ever remember of seeing a super crit, but it's all about this this girl who is fascinated by him. And it's almost like this creepily fascination, yeah. you know? So for me, the big takeaway was, we don't want those boy who can fly stories, you know? We want disabled people who just happen to be a part of the cast, you yeah. know? And, don't ignore the disability, but don't always make it the focal point. You yeah, know, yeah. if your plot is centered on the disability itself, disability is a really bad plot device. You've already failed. Yeah. Um, also, I wasn't su su surprised by this, but such an important aspect, as, as you mentioned, was the disabled mimicry, which is disabled people being portrayed by non-disabled people yeah. to actually have a value for how bad that was because no other study that I've seen has done that, has said yeah. these many people are non-disabled, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it, I want to correct that number. It wasn't 70%. Yeah. It was 70 out of 708 people. Oh, so about okay. It was about 10% of okay. the characters are played by actual disabled actors, which means 90% are played by non-disabled actors, or we don't know if they're disabled, yeah. so. Okay, so it's, it's even higher than what I had. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. How do you think, like, like how much representation, representation, or, or I mean, I mean, you, you told me that there's a lot of representation, but it's just could be like more positively. So, like, at what point do you think there will be like enough good uh, representation? Um, like, like what what would that look like? Like, what would the numbers look like? What would the shows look like in like a perfect? Yeah, you know? I disabled people are the largest marginalized group in the world. We're everywhere, mm -hmm. but you don't always see us because the world is not always accessible. So, but we're there or you might see us and just not pay attention to us you know mm -hmm. because uh people are kind of bred to kind of look down on disabled people and mm -hmm. so they're not always interested in getting to know us they're you know they may be some i i often feel like i people see me but they don't you know what i mean like they see me and they know what i do but they don't really see me as a person and i think when you don't see disabled people as people it's easy to overlook us even yeah. being there so what do the numbers look like i would love to see way more bit characters that are visibly disabled because it's harder to get a bit character that's not visibly disabled where you're not just like I, uh, I am allergic to bee stings, you know, and that's your only representation, yeah. you know. But if you have like a visibly disabled person, like somebody that is blind with a cane or a dog, yeah. and they're walking around in the background and they're extras and big characters, mm -hmm. I would love to see that for that area. For main characters, we need all kinds of disabilities represented. We need all kinds of disabled characters. And they need to their disability needs to be a part of their life but it doesn't need to be the only part of their life you know they don't need to be defined by their disability i would love to see more non-white disabled people yeah. particularly lgbt non-white disabled okay. people there's a huge overlap between lgbt and disability communities yeah. particularly because when you're marginalized uh, you're more likely to have chronic health disabilities and mental health disabilities. Sense, yeah. So you can develop disabilities from discrimination and oppression oh. and mistreatment. And when you said, what was I surprised by? I wasn't surprised by this, but I think a lot of people yeah. will be surprised to know there's virtually no LGBT disability representation at all. 
And that's got to change because of this overlap. The only LGBT disability representation I remember from last year's study yeah. was on Pope. And those were people with AIDS. And that's the only representation we got, mm -hmm. which is we need to see more stories about AIDS, mm -hmm. particularly in non-white communities in a, in a way that's done. Pose is fantastic. It's a great form of representation yeah and that's a good starting point but uh that can't be our only representation right yeah if i as a white trans non-binary queer disabled person yeah. i've never seen myself represented then a non-white queer trans non-binary okay. disabled person yeah. hasn't either yeah um so i want to talk about like television versus other mediums in just my non-scientific perception of just what I've seen in terms of TV shows and movies, um, my experience yeah. has been that TV shows are generally better at representation than movies. Um, do you agree with that? Yeah. Yes and no. I would say TV probably has a, I, and this is non-scientific. I have yeah. not done a study yet. I can tell you what I've read of studies okay. like this in yeah. movies the numbers are kind of similar in terms of what what we've seen in the mm -hmm. the basic idea of representation but they're also not delving as deep as we do and yeah. i'm really interested to get the funding to fund studies yeah. into film uh because i would love to be able to give you a definitive okay yes tv's better but my perception is it's all bad, if that yeah. makes sense. It's all it not good. Yeah. yeah. And uh, t film is almost worse for me because there's this phenomenon that is known as the Disability Academy Award phenomenon, where the majority of best actor and actress, not just winners, but also nominees have been for uh, engaging in disabled mimicry. Mm -hmm. So a lot of big actors trying to make you know some big academy award performance will look to disability or uh they always look to marginalization they want to be a trans person a disabled person uh an alcoholic or mm -hmm. you know something that they feel is meaty we hear that all the time i want a meaty role you know i want yeah, yeah. i want a challenge but my life is not a challenge my life is not a challenge for you to try to mimic. Mm -hmm. And it's so disgusting and harmful that this is the message. And there are some repeat offenders who do stuff like this. Hilary Swank is one of them. She's played multiple characters with disability, always nominated. She won for Million Dollar Baby. The whole plot of Million Dollar Baby was she was this boxer and again, spoilers, if you have not watched this movie super yeah. old, this is a courtesy to give you a spoiler, yeah. everybody. She literally gets hurt, and then with the next minute is like, kill me, and he pulls the plug. So it's all about her saying, nope, I'm, I'm disabled, so kill me. And that won an award, and I was too young at the time, but disabled yeah. people were protesting it. You know, there was a whole group of disabled people who went to Hollywood and protested the Oscars and said, this is not okay. You're celebrating, awarding awarding someone for portraying our death and, and romanticizing this idea. And she won and people don't care. Like that's what it feels like, people don't care. Oh, well, that's what it's like being disabled. Oh, well, we don't care. It was a good performance, get over it. That's what I, what I hear all the time, but you know, it it does matter because that treatment affects what people think about me. So Hillary became physically disabled to need the level of care someone like me would need. You know, she wouldn't be able to walk. She couldn't move most of her body. That seeing a movie like that says to someone like me, your life's not worth living. You should consider assisted suicide. Yeah, and yeah. there's a phenomenon where disabled people do consider assisted suicide after these movies come out. And there have been instances where I've known people to kill themselves after seeing these films because 
it personifies the idea our lives are not worth living. So I don't think it's good to just have all this representation and not include disabled people behind the scenes, helping craft the stories. It's getting to that point where it's clear that non-disabled people do not understand how to write disability. They just don't do it right. So they need to include us and it's going to make their stories better. Yeah. It's going to make the whole thing better and it's going to make the world better for us. So, and I know I mentioned Hillary Swank, but Julianne Moore is just as guilty. And then we have my good friend, Eddie Redmayne, who likes to play trans and disabled characters and get awarded for it. So she is yeah. not the only offender. Mm. Although it is really interesting to me that all of these examples are white people. So yeah. I'm not sure if it's just that white people are more likely to do it or there are just more white roles for it to happen. Yeah, yeah. another name that's coming to mind, probably not um, not someone who's particularly egregious like that. But like, so I think someone who, who is like a less worse example of disabled mimicry, uh, you can tell me if you agree. Charlie Cox, who, who's in Daredevil, he's not blind, but he's playing a blind, a blind person. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. I, I, I can't see. 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 But he 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 sort of he he did like blind himself sort of to film it like. But he that's had, not the same. Though. I know. Yeah. But yeah. You, you know. I also think like why couldn't you hire a blind person? In fact, we we uh we had a film disc discussion on Twitter, yeah. and I'm mm -hmm. I'm certain Lexi Alexander who uh directed Green Street Hooligans and has directed episodes of Supergirl and various yeah. other television shows. She said, I know blind people who can do martial arts. So why didn't they hire someone like that? Yeah, yeah. You know, the perception that we're incapable. It's like, well, we can't hire a blind person because there's martial arts. And she said, why not? I've seen blind people fight. And mm -hmm. she's a she's a fight coordinator. Yeah. She does fight, you know, so I would trust someone like Lexi Alexander to know yeah. this. And when she herself is like, no, why are the why is there no blind person playing Daredevil? Yeah. That to me says, you know, and and you said something that struck me as really interesting. Yeah. You said a less a a a better example of disabled mimicry. The less egregious. I don't think there are good examples. Okay. Yeah, I just don't think there are any good examples. You know, that would be like saying, well, Emma Stone was okay in Aloha because the actress doesn't particularly look Asian that much, but she's still Asian, right. so it was okay. But, but, you know, that community said, no, Emma Stone is not okay, you know, it still harms us. So I don't think that there's less, you know, I, in, in any marginalized group, you yeah. know, the less harmful, you know, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Are there any, we talked about like, perfect represent like not not per but like like where the numbers would be good um are there any shows you like like specific shows that you thought did a particularly good job with representation that should be like a model yeah. for other shows one of my favorite forms of representation last year was maddie weber on um macgyver mm -hmm. played by the amazing meredith eaton she's a little person and Maddie's in charge of the organization that MacGyver and Co. works mm -hmm. at. So she has a very important role. In the earlier seasons, we see Maddie has been married, so she's allowed to have a, a sexual identity and yeah. a romantic identity. She was married to a husband. She has a backstory. We learn a bit like that. I want to see more for her, but 
seeing actress in this level of role, Ashton said to me, you know, she reminds me of Celia Ward on FBI. FBI. So Celia Ward has the same type of role. She's like the head of the FBI or like the overseer person. You know, Maddie's role is for a private org. Sila's role is for the FBI, but it's the same type of role. Maddie could play Sila's role, or I mean, uh, Meredith could play the role Sila played, and Sila could play the role Meredith played, and yeah. it would, it, it could still happen. Is is the point, you know? Yeah. So by giving that role to Meredith Eaton, they said, you know, look, a disabled person can play this awesome character. Mm -hmm. Another show that does that is Silent Witness. Uh, when Liz Carr just ended her tenure on there, she's a disabled actress. She walks but can use a or she walks but can use a wheelchair. She uses a wheelchair but can walk and stand up. So seeing that's really important because so many times when people say, oh, you stood up from your wheelchair, you're obviously faking. But there's this whole world of disabled people uh, who can stand up and still walk. And it might be that they have pain. It might be that it's yeah. hard to walk. It might be they just can't walk long distances. But these are, yeah. these people finally got representation, almost like vindication. You know, yeah. I used to be one of those people. I walked until I was 16. I used a scooter part of the time when I was a teenager. So I remember getting up out of my scooter and people saying that, why do you need that scooter? I had an, an older person say, try to drag me out of my scooter once and say, you're, you're taking this scooter away from an old person who needs it. You're too young to need it. And I was like, this is my private scooter. This is not the store scooter. because. Exactly, yeah. We were in a we were in a supermarket, but here she is trying to yank me out of my private scooter, saying, "Oh, honey, you're too young. You can't use this. You know, maybe if we saw some kids who could, you know, walk but still needed a scooter, people wouldn't be trying to yank a ten-year-old out of their scooter in Kroger. You know, I completely lost my train of thought and what we were mentioning. Oh, yeah, great example. So, um. Liz Carr, seeing her, again, I wish there was more. She yeah. had so many great roles and Liz really worked with the writer. She said, you know, uh, my character Clarissa needs a partner. So they gave her a husband and they gave her some backstories and they gave her some stories that were told really well about disability yeah. too, and that which was really nice to see. So we have these little, these little pebbles of hope, these little examples of yeah. great portrayals, but but a lot of the examples are not good, mm -hmm. even when they include disabled actors. This is kind of a fun question for like basically well, one of the basically the last question. If you were pitching a TV show or movie with a disabled lead, what what would what would that look like? Well, the character would be disabled, but the story yeah. wouldn't be about their disability. Yeah. Uh, right now I'm thinking something sci-fi okay. and more than one disabled person on the show. I hate how it's like, okay, I got our, I got our token. I yeah, got our token yeah. wheelchair user, that's representation. Or Ashton and I were also just talking about, because we're, uh, we're trying to watch the shows that we thought we might struggle with. Uh, yeah. So we're watching Disney Channel shows right now. Yeah. And we were always, we're always joking about how, hang on one second, I lost my thought again. I yeah. don't know what's with my brain. Okay, let me begin that again. Um, <laughs> no, it definitely would be a sci-fi show and it would have more than one, they say, oh yeah, that's what I was gonna say. That we were talking about how, when you watch a Disney Channel show, sometimes it feels like they're just, ticking off boxes okay yeah. we got the the one black guy we got the latinx girl uh okay we got the asian kid and you know so it's like yeah. one person's this one person's that we don't always see you know and just like how funny that is that she and i both noticed that while watching mm -hmm. disney shows because I right now one of the shows I'm watching on Disney is Bunked. They have a Latinx girl 
a black teenager, teenage male, and um, someone I believe is is mixed race. And yeah. and so it's kind of like, you know, okay, we got the mixed person, we got the black person, we got the POC. I feel like when we see TV, it's your white, your black, or your POC. And that's how we actually broke down our representation. And it worked out because there was way less POC even in disability representation. It's like, white black and everybody else and and, right. and that baffles me because there's so many other op options beyond you know yeah so it's like so many nationalities are covered under like under people of color so it's like but right. it's, it, it's it's like it's like all of them are still less than the like the white or the black yeah exactly exactly yeah. so i would love to see my show have diverse representation just all around and i would i would want it to reflect our world in terms of we're not yeah. all white we're not all black we're not all cis or straight or all of these other things that we see and it's especially yeah. visible in the disability rep yeah. there's no surprise that cis white straight males have the that the biggest right. representation mm -hmm. when it comes to the disabled community. So my show would not be that. Yeah. It would be what we haven't seen before. Yeah. And it would be from a disabled LGBT perspective because that's who we are. Mm -hmm. So I can't go into much details before beyond that because I actually do have two shows I'm working on developing gotcha. right now. Yes. But uh, yeah, sci-fi is one of them. The other thing would be Slice of Life. I like doing Slice of Life, TV, film. So it would be a reflection of our world. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, the character would be disabled, probably LGBT. Mm -hmm. I want to see myself one day. And maybe, maybe that means that eventually I cast myself in yeah. something. But before I die, I want to see a disabled trans wheelchair user somewhere. So, um, is there anything else you want to talk about that that I didn't like directly ask you about, or anything you you want to add to what we talked about? I can tell you what I'm working on in terms of streaming. Mm -hmm. uh, I I stream on Twitch. Uh, it's just Twitch.tv/slash Dominic Evans, and it, it's also about representation. Mm -hmm. I kept hearing friends say they didn't want to show themselves on camera because they were getting bullied because mm -hmm. they don't game. You know, they might not game in their wheelchair. They might not game in a way that looks like how other people game. And people were coming in and harassing them. And I said, you know, I can handle that. I've been harassed my whole life. I can deal with it. No big deal. So I started doing it and I, I stream laying down because I have chronic pain and it's much less painful to stream laying down. Yeah. So I wanted to be the representation that needed to be seen. And it's all about uh, showing that gaming is for everyone and you can game no matter how you do it. So, and you can stream no matter how you do it. So, it, and it's hard. People don't always want to watch disabled people yeah. or they don't know what to say or they think it's awkward so they don't want to stop by and talk. So getting people to watch can be hard, but it's so important. Mm -hmm. So um, I just want to urge everybody to find disabled streamers and watch them and celebrate them and, and help us get representation because yeah. That's the one area people can help us. Support our work, watch it, highlight it, send it off to your friends and encourage them to watch it because that will help contribute to greater representation for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, you 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 have a Twitch, so we can um, we can link that in the description. Uh, you also have a um, you have a website, right? And then you also have film discs website yeah yeah dominic evans.com and film this.com film this started as a hashtag that's what it was we talked on twitter once a week about disability representation and then it just grew out of there and now 
it's a media monitoring organization and we talk about representation. Very cool. All right. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming on and talking with me. I think I, I think I learned a lot. I think, um, I think people watching will learn a lot. Great. Thank you so much, Justin. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe. And I hope to see you next time. Stay shway.